everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Do Good to Lead Well webinar and podcast series. My name is Craig Dowden. I'm your host. And in this program, I have the profound privilege to talk to top CEOs, thought leaders, best-selling authors, and TED speakers to share their insights and expertise with a live audience, which we then transform to a podcast. And just to give you a little bit of background, for those of you who are return watchers and listeners, great to have you back. I'm really excited about this conversation this afternoon. For those of you who are new to the Do Good to Lead Well webinar and podcast series, great to have you on board. This series culminated, started uh, before the publication of my first book, Do Good to Lead Well, and I have the profound privilege to talk to so many incredible chief executives, senior executives, best-selling authors, and I wanted to open up the conversation to a wider community, to a wider audience, so we could learn how we could be at our best, have important conversations about topics that matter. And this was really relaunched at the beginning, three years ago, at the beginning of the pandemic, and has continued on ever since. So over the last several years, I've interviewed over 80 CEOs, best-selling authors, and TED speakers, and to get their insights. So really looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, especially excited, uh, love speaking with Heather. There's just so much energy and insight and expertise and experience that I'm very happy for us to, to dive into today. So as a brief bio, can't cover everything. Uh, Heather Tolk recently joined TELUS Business Solutions as their president of commercial and public sector. Currently based in Toronto, Heather has received a number of industry awards, including being named to the, to the Diversity 50 by the Canadian Board Diversity Council, Canada's Most Powerful Women Top 100 through the Women's Executive Network, and Canada's Top 40 Under 40. Heather passionately believes in helping make communities better than we found them and is involved in several causes for mental health, youth, diversity, and inclusion. She sits on the board of Canadian Hearing Services and is past chair of the Toronto chapter of the International Women's Forum. And one really cool note uh, for me, fellow Newfoundlander, which I think is awesome, so I always love to highlight that. So Heather, welcome to the Do Good to Lead Well podcast. Great to have you here. Thanks, Craig. It's my pleasure to be here. Really excited. Thank you. Well, uh, and uh, again, can't wait to dive in. And for all of you who are live, Heather has kindly agreed to take your questions. So type in so you can ask, uh, get your insight from one of the top business leaders in our country. So, um, and, and Heather, uh, I wanna start with, there's so much emphasis on leadership these days. Uh, we were even chatting before we came live about that. So what do you feel are the key leadership qualities that people need to possess and that are important now more than ever before? Yeah, it's a great, a great question, uh, Craig. And, you know, I think some things about leadership, um, you know, when I look over my career, my experience with leadership have been very stable and other things are really evolving. So uh, it's an interesting question in that perspective. Um, you know, I think for leaders, first of all, there's a generosity that's required in leadership. I think you have to be thinking not of yourself, but of others. And whether those others are your direct team, your extended team, your customers, your community, uh, I think being generous in trying to put the needs of others at the forefront is a really key aspect that I've seen good leaders and great leaders over the years really, really take on. Um, I think there's also a grit and a tenacity that's really important in leadership. Uh, I think leadership can be really tough. Uh, and sometimes in, as a leader, you have to make really tough decisions and, or, and you have to tackle really complex problems. And so an ability to fail, try again, fail, try again, uh, and really you know, not accept defeat, I think is a really important uh, part of leadership. And then in terms of things that are evolving, I think um, one that I've seen over the last number of years that I think has really come to the forefront that maybe I wouldn't have put as much emphasis on um, in the past is really a, a systems mindset. And, and I don't mean IT systems, I mean like a wider systems mindset. And I think leaders today are inundated 
inundated with information, inundated with demands, inundated with the pace of change that's happening in every industry and in every sector. And I think you have to be able to raise your head up. I like to say to people, you know, make sure you're not always head down and pencil up. Sometimes you got to be pencil down and head up and really, you know, try and find a way to hover above it all and say, okay, am I missing? How am I looking at this fully? How does this all fit together? I think that's something that is incredibly important today that more so than I've seen in my career. Mm, well, and already we've got questions. <laughs> I love the <laughs> Got questions coming in, and uh, and you struck a chord with Stephen on the systems uh, that that approach. So I've been struggling with that. Any tips around? So how to create more space for that? Couldn't agree more. And is struggling with how to get that more embedded in the day to day. Yeah, you know, I think it goes maybe with one of the things in leadership that I've tried to work on a lot, which is discipline. Like you've got to be like as a leader your absolute number one asset is time and it's also your scarcest asset and so you have to have a tremendous discipline in how you allocate your time uh, how you choose what to do and i use the word choose you know a, a number of years ago i i found myself saying a lot you know oh i'm really busy i'm too busy i didn't get to that this week i was too busy and i really found that that was very defeatist and I, I formed a way to to cause myself to reframe it where I you know sometimes I still make that mistake you know how we say oh, I'm too busy but really I try and reframe it into I didn't choose mm. so I'm so I'm choosing to do this not that it's not that I'm too busy to get to it I'm making a conscious choice and I think when it comes to that time that you spend getting yourself out of the day-to-day, -day, getting yourself out of the frenzy and looking widely with a systems and a more global view. It's really about saying to yourself, that's a choice I'm going to make. And I'm choosing to take a chance that something else isn't going to get done and take, and it's risk tolerance and, and taking that risk to say, you know what, um, I'm taking a risk that, you know, this thing that someone else might think is really important isn't going to get done because I know that that broader view of, this problem or this opportunity or this company or this division or this group, whatever it is that you're, you're thinking about or the strategy is a leverage point where if I spend my time there, it's gonna pay off bigger than where I might otherwise choose to spend my time. And so I think, you know, it, it's not simple, but it's, it's, it, but it's, it's as straightforward as that. It, it's hard work, but I think, uh, you know, I think that's what you really have to do. Well, I, so right away, Stephen said, awesome. Two words I'm taking away from this, discipline and choice. I think that's, <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, that's mic drop right there. Uh, and, and Heather, to build on that, I love how you frame it as choice. Uh, and what I find fascinating in the work that I do uh, with organizations and executives is around those small, as you say, that subtle shift, right? Where you go, okay, now I'm choosing, as opposed to saying I'm busy, too busy, I'm making choices. And that is such an empowering and powerful way to frame things because now, all right, there's that sense of agency. I'm in control as opposed to things are just washing over me and now I'm reacting to that. And I love that insight uh, that you've provided. Got another question uh, from Allison, <laughs> again, just coming. Love that you you, you touched on the importance of, of failure. Uh, even though organizations talk about them, <laughs> that idea, many when it comes to actually embracing failure, it seems like almost a disconnected message. So any tips around how to make failure and the, those necessary missteps part of a culture so that they people can do that more often and learn from it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's a tough one. I had a hard time for most of my life ever saying the word failure. And even now when I say it, I I get a, a little bit of a clench, you know, where I'm like, mm, I don't know if I'm, okay, maybe I'm not gonna call it a failure. Maybe I'm gonna call it a setback. Maybe I'm gonna, like, you know, even the word brings an emotional response that something's really bad here, right? Um, and so I think you've got to, like anything else that's stigmatized, uh, the best, you know, there's a lot of research actually in the mental health industry that the best way to break down 
stigma against mental health is actually exposure to people who are experiencing mental health issues. And I think it's the same thing. The best way to stigma to destigmatize failure is to talk openly about failure, to use the word failure, to make it just another part of our vernacular. Um, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of pitfalls in it though. Like no one wants to fail. Like I, I think maybe I've told you this story before, Craig, but when my son was very little, like probably grade one or something, he was playing hockey and he was at the age where they didn't put the score up at all, you know, cause you know, they wanted the kids just to have fun, you know, so I'm out and I took my kid to hockey and I'm driving him home. And, you know, I said, Oh honey, like, did you have fun? Like, and, uh, you know, did you enjoy it or whatever? And he goes, mom, we lost. And I'm like, no, no, honey, like, it's okay. Like, you know, they don't keep the score. There's no score up. It's just about having fun. He goes, mom, it was 13 to two. We lost. And I'm like, here's this little five-year-old. No one's keeping score, but in his mind, he's keeping score because he's already figured out that life keeps score. That games keep score, that score is important, that this concept of win or loss is more than the effort. And I thought to myself, wow, like what an amazing moment and insight to see how early that gets programmed into our brains. Mm -hmm. And so when I talked about earlier about the process effort, I think that's the systems view. I think that's also the, the secret to failure. We set the scorecard by outputs, right? What did you achieve? What did you do? What goal did you reach? What objective? And we need to shift more to what did you learn? What did you attempt? What did you take away? What's the tuition value of that experience? And how are you going to apply that next? And if we're measuring ourselves by our ability to learn and grow and get better, then that unlocks the ability for us to innovate more. And, you know, I built most of my career around innovation and innovation comes from the learning in what you attempt way more than it comes from what you achieve. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and thank you. And lots of comments uh, in the comment section about how insightful that is. And I love how you talked about the the stigma attached and appreciate your that's why I was I'm it's such a joy speaking with you, your own transparency about, hey, even I've said this five minutes ago and I'm like, ah, uh, and the power in that going, well, and how do we, how do we overcome that? And there's, uh, again, wonderful uh, parallel research in psychology as well as that our relationship with quote unquote failure is, is awkward and, and can be undermine our ability to be successful and recognizing that and then stepping back and I love the acronym for fail, uh, or one of them, you know, from action I learn. And exactly as you're saying, you learn so I much more than that. you try. And, and, it's, and it's a necessary part of innovation. And I also think it's so great, Heather, that you touched on how it's, it's an in, essential ingredient for our growth. We, we, that's part of that process. So re, re, reframing our relationship with failure and then looking at what it brings to us so so great so again so many uh wonderful. i also think and just that one other thing on that i also think there's a corollary to breaking down failure and it's the magic of the word yet mm, right so so when you say oh i didn't do that yet you know i wasn't able to get that done yet that didn't work yet like yet is the is the energy and the food of innovation mm. and every great innovation over time is because someone's saying oh yeah we can't you know we can't light up the room without candles yet <laughs> we can't talk we can't do cross-atlantic flight yet because at the moment you say you can't or you didn't or you don't if you lock that in as an as a static state that will continue you'll never innovate it's always about yet I love that, and thank you for adding that on. And uh, and 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 it's such once again a subtle, yet instrumental change. Because if you say it and then as, and then end it full stop, without that at the end, well now we're making an absolute, <laughs> and, right. and decided 
well, we're not going to be able to do it. And that's it. We stop. There's no more forward momentum. And I love that. That adding yet is that, all right, so now that's hope, that's potential, that's possibility for a different future. Uh, love this. You also touched on, because I think this is so important and in conversations that I have with executives and aspiring executives, you, you touched on kind of that evolving landscape of leadership. Like we are in unchartered territory here with so many things that and for, I, I hear you know, people say up is down, down is up. Where are we going? It's unusual. It, it, so what are your thoughts around this almost new terrain of leadership and the, the challenges and opportunities it provides? Yeah, you know, it's it's a fascinating question. Like it is evolving so fast. And and I think it's evolving fast because, you know, we are in uncharted. Well, you know what? I don't know that we're in uncharted waters. We're in uncharted waters from a tech perspective, as we always are. There's always technological advancement you know, generation after generation after generation. And now obviously AI is like, you know, doing to the doing to the environment now what the internet did in 1999, you know, like it's just exploding the world. Um, so that is definitely uncharted. But I think a lot of what we're facing right now is uncharted by us, mm. you know? And so when I think about it, like, you know, I, I've been around a long time, a lot of people would say, um, and I've never worked until this year in a rising interest rate environment, right? I've never worked in an environment where human resources were so scarce and so in demand and skills were changing so fast and the need for skills were changing so fast. I've never worked in an environment where there seems to be micro level geopolitical strife, like changes in the way at like at local levels, communities are dealing with things and problems at a pace that we've seen. But that's not to say other people haven't. Like other people lived through rising interest rates and led through them before. Other people led through, you know, the civil rights movement when it, when it happened, you know, the um, at the beginning. Like other people have led through climates like this, but none of them are still working and none of them are still leading. So for our generation of leadership, this is an uncharted time. So I spend a lot of time thinking to myself, okay, like, what can I learn from the past? What can I pull out of the history of those times? I like to read biographies. I like to read historical, um, you know, fiction and nonfiction. I think you can glean from both. But, you know, I think we really have to realize these paradigms are different. And I don't even like the word paradigms, but just the environment's different. and we have to be open to that and we have to be constantly questioning, okay, am I doing things in a way that I always did them that were successful, but they're not going to be successful now because my operating environment has changed so much. And, you, and as a leader, you have to be attuned to that and you have to be willing to grow. And then the final thing I would say on it is you have to spend time with generations. You got to find a way to be around 24 year olds. You have to have, find a way to be around 13 year olds. You have to find a way to be around 80 year olds. Like the more you spend with people who are living different moments in time, the broader your thinking gets. And I, I think that's really important. And that's something I would like to choose to do more of um, because I every time I do, I come away with, wow. Like they're thinking about that in a way I wouldn't have seen if I hadn't had that discussion. Well, I love that point. And again, lots of great comments. Uh, thanking you for that answer. I love the emphasis on the diversity of perspectives uh, and linking it you know, generationally and then how that expands our thinking. And so much evidence shows us that by having diverse perspectives around the table, exactly as you say, that we have a much richer point of view, a more accurate point of view about what's going on, as well as possible solutions. And I think that's so incredibly helpful for us and I also love the point because I think this is so vital is how you emphasize the importance of testing or questioning our assumptions like is what I'm believing today still going to be relevant tomorrow we hope so the world's changing really quickly or things can change quickly so just having that moment of pause and I remember lots of great work done where people have difficulty 
just falling back and will want to get back to the way things were, well, that creates challenges for where we are and doesn't allow that innovation you've talked about, Heather, the ability to learn and grow, so, so important for us as, as leaders and executives. I've got another question. <laughs> they keep coming in, uh, which That's I knew. Great. Uh, I love it. it is. It's fabulous. Uh, Carolyn was wondering, uh, love that you talked about AI, uh, recognizes a big question. What are your thoughts in terms of how you feel it's going to affect leadership and leaders as well as organizations? Like any preliminary thoughts about where this, where we're going to go? I am so excited about AI and I am so in awe of both what I know about AI and what I know I don't know about AI. Uh, and so we're actually inside TELUS doing a lot of work in this area and using AI a lot in our business um, and so that we can learn from it. Is it's an experimentation uh, world, uh, but it's interesting when I mentioned the internet, I remember I worked on the launch actually of a, you know, when internet can first be bought for your home. And so I was, uh, so I am that old for the people watching. Uh, and uh, I remember sitting around the, you know, meeting rooms as we were planning out the launch of this product. And this would have been like dial up internet I'm talking about. So this was like 1994 kind of thing. And so you'll laugh at this. So we're talking about what the internet could be and how big it would be, you know, and how many people were going to buy it. And of course, we grossly underestimated how it would, you know, how many people would have internet at their home and work. But I remember really clear discussion and saying to, and you know, I was young then, I was saying to one of the executives in our company at the time, I said, you know, this is going to be so big that someday you're going to ask people their email address and you're going to expect them to have one like you do their fax number. Like, and honest to God, Craig, we thought that that was going to be the killer app for the internet <laughs> when everyone had an email address and that you would expect it, right? And I feel like AI is the same thing. Like, we have no idea where this is going to go. But what I do know is when you see a technology proliferating at the speed it is, when you see a technology that has the potential to change the game in so many ways and assist, you know, people have a lot of fear around it. And there are obviously huge issues that we had to tackle with, with ethics in AI, with privacy in AI, with data usage in AI, just like we had to with the internet. And some might say we didn't totally succeed. Uh, some There's some, been some good and some bad. But in general, it's been a huge boon for civilization. And that's the way I feel about AI. And I think that, um, you know, when you look at, the, at a tool, if you think of it that way, that has the ability to remove so much of the friction between you and what you're trying to do, any time in civilization, there's been a tool like that, whether it's the printing press, whether it's the wheel, whether it's the ability to create fire voluntarily, whether, you know, any time the steam engine, any time there's a tool like that that's emerged, society and civilization have leaped forward in terms of their ability to innovate and grow. And I think that's what AI is going to be. And so I, I, I could be more excited. And all I would say to anyone watching or listening is, you know, whether it's chat GPT or anything else, get in, play around with it, use it, learn about it. When you see something with AI and you're LinkedIn, read it. Like this is something you want to know about and we're all learning our way through it. You know, if anybody tells you they figured out where it's going, don't listen to them. Anybody else, <laughs> listen to what they say, learn, stay close to this because this is going to be bigger than your email address. This is going to be something that is going to be intrinsic to your life within the next five years. Well, I love that. And thank you. And uh, I guess that's my next question is going to be deleted. I know everything about AI. So uh, no, I, and yeah. I love how you frame it as a learning journey. We're all on this learning journey. And, uh, and Brad, uh, really appreciate your excitement around AI and also the acknowledgement of the fear. So any thoughts around how to have how to engage people who are fearful of what the the promise and the potential challenge of that technology is? How do you have those conversations effectively? What can you do to address the fear? 
Uh, I think, you know, like anything else you have to, you know, you have to be, you have to listen. Like, first of all, some of the fears are probably very grounded and they're things that we really have to consider and we really have to learn from and make sure people are paying attention to Like we do have an obligation to society as you know, and so, um, so I think, first of all, understanding the fear, understanding where it's coming from, understanding what, you know, there's a great concept um, uh, that I learned recently, which I love, which is the concept of pre-mortems. You know, everybody thinks about post-mortems, but the idea of pre-mortems, so to say, okay, so, you know, Craig, you're an AI enthusiast, or maybe you're not. So you tell me now, if I write a headline for you, and I say, AI is the best invention for civilization in the history of civilization. What, and that's the headline five years from now. What do you think has happened to lead us to that headline? And then I go to someone else and I say, okay, let's do the pre-mortem in the other. So, so the headline is, AI is the worst thing that's ever happened to civilization. So now you tell me, as you know, maybe you do it with a group or whatever you say, tell me what happened that led us to that headline. And if you can visualize that way, then you, you're you aware and you have a way better chance at avoiding some of the real pitfalls. So I don't believe you should blindly say, this is great. I don't think you should blindly say, this is awful. I think you should say, okay, what would it look like to be great? What would it look like to be awful? And how do we as leaders and members of society engineer you know, protect the things that could go awful and make sure that, you know, we stand in the way of those and accelerate the things that could be great. And, um, and so those are the kind of discussions. I love talking to people who are afraid, who are not afraid, but are fearful of AI, who are worried about AI, because I think some of the best learning about what we need to do to use AI responsibly comes from those people. Well, and multiple comments about love the con. Thanks for sharing the concept of pre-mortem, pre-mortem, awesome, uh, awesome ideas. And and I love Heather, and I'm a huge fan of of pre-mortems. And I and I really appreciate how you did both. How you say, hey, let's look at scenario A, which is best case. Let's look at scenario B, worst case, if you will. And now let's see. Okay, compare, contrast. Let's look. And it provides us with different pathways for a path forward, different ideas to consider. And and it's such an empowering way to, again, get us thinking differently around this. And I really appreciate the, the point around listening and understanding, because I think sometimes that can get whether people are an advocate for or they are passionately against they lead with the, well, you're wrong, you're wrong. And I love how you say, well, look, we, we need to need to listen, we need to elevate our understanding, we need to hear what's going on, and especially like how you say, because that can better inform our approach to it. So much fantastic, fantastic insight there. Uh, another topic around leadership that, that, that comes up is around authentic leadership. And so I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on what's the role of authentic leadership in terms of being effective and then also who is authentic heather <laughs> wow well, that's a, that's great uh great questions you know i think authentic leadership is the absence of fear mm. because i think if you're not afraid of the downside of who you might be then you can only be yourself and I think what stands in the way of being yourself is your preconceived biases or notions or fears of how I'm supposed to be, how I'm supposed to act, how I'm supposed to work, how I'm supposed to show up. And that can be really, really stifling. So, and, and I'm not saying, you know, throw all societal norms out, out the world, like, you know, you know, that's not what I mean. What I mean is within the societal norms that you believe in, within the value system that you hold true, um, don't be afraid of, you know, the expectation of how you should do something. Try and focus on who, you know, how do I recruit the best me to get the results that are best in line with my values out of the certain situation? And 
whatever that might look like. And so I think that's about being authentic is not worrying because, you know, and I personally, when you talk about my authentic self, I spent a lot of my career in that trap. I have to say, and certainly when I was younger as a leader, um, when I was first leading teams and leading people, I had a filter and I still struggle with it sometimes, Craig, like letting that filter go of like what it's supposed to look like to lead people, how a business person is supposed to act, what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to. And, you know, that fear of being wrong in the way you approach something really, in my case, brings out the worst to me. So, you know, and because you're, you lose your intuition, you lose your intuitiveness, you in lose your, you lose your ability to act in the way that's true because you're constantly filtering in your mind. And by the way, you lose your empathy. And when I say you lose your empathy and maybe some other people with you know, more brain power than I have wouldn't, but for me, I'm so busy in my mind, second guessing myself that I lost my ability to focus on others. Mm. And I think I became you know, much more self-centered in the way I was showing up, much more self-involved in the way I was showing up uh, because I was just constantly second guessing myself. And I don't know whether you call that, you know, you'll tell me because you're the expert in this. Well, I don't know whether that's imposter syndrome or something else, or, you know, I don't know what the psychology, but that's, that's how it showed up for me. Mm -hmm. So in terms of my authentic self, like I really come back to my values. I come back to, you know, I want to live my life in a way where I'm making a difference, where the difference was important. And, and I was sharing this with you earlier. Um, I did some training um, recently in learning, been doing a lot in the last few years researching on the indigenous, the situation with indigenous peoples in Canada. And one of the concepts that came out of that was this idea of how to live your life in a way where you're a great ancestor. And, you know, I think when I feel my authentic self, it's when I have that in mind, when I'm thinking about like, that's where I get my joy. How am I making this place better than I found it? And how do I live it in a way that, you know, lives on longer than I do. And so when I, when I'm thinking that way, I intuitively think my authentic self comes out when I'm second guessing myself on how I'm supposed to show up or how I'm supposed to behave. That's the worst of me that comes to the table. Well, uh, so uh, this one, lots of positive comments before. This was, <laughs> I can't even keep up with them all. Uh, love, I, a couple of said, I want to be a great ancestor. Thank you. Love that. I uh, love that framing. And, and by the way, none of these things are mine. They're things I read. And unfortunately, I'm like you, I never remember who they are. So whoever the yeah. original author of this is, I'm not meaning to steal your work. But. That's right. No, well, and it's great. These are a fantastic concepts. And I love that. Um, because again, with that idea of being a great ancestor, now I'm looking at, I'm stepping back and looking at what I'm saying and doing in this moment in a much longer lens. And I can yeah. see the impacts and the implications. And so it's such a powerful, and you talked about choice before and intention. These are really, really impactful things that, that we can do. And also appreciate that link to the absence of empathy. When, if we're in our heads and we're, how am I supposed to be? So not just disconnected from our authentic selves, then because of all of that noise, it's really challenging to pay attention to what's going on around us. So I love that linkage. And as well as that, that piece around, it's about values expression, bringing it back to who I am, what are the values that I hold? And then how is it that what I'm doing supports those values in alignment with that? And in conversations that I have, I have to say, when people feel they're most awesome and feel like, hey, I'm doing what I was meant to do, it's when values are in alignment and when they're at their lowest and they're frustrated or they're really struggling, it's when values are misaligned. Uh, so bringing it back to that, I think it's just, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. I also know, Heather, that you're very passionate about social purpose in business and you think a lot about it and, and lead with that in mind. So can you talk about a little bit more around that and and what's really shaped your thinking and 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 for things for the audience to be able to reflect on in their own leadership journeys? Yeah, you know, 
I mean, I, it is an area of real passion for, for, for me. And I am so excited about how, I, I don't think my generation can take credit for it necessarily, but maybe we can, because we raise the kids who are doing this, but how the next generation is demanding more social accountability from businesses, more, you know, environmental, social, you know, community contribution. Um, and I think, you know, it's a very, it goes back for me. I mean, it's, it's not only a, I'd say a Canadian thing, but you know, it's the way I, I was brought up, right? Like my, I remember my grandfather saying to me, you know, Heather, I want you, every time you, anything you do, you need to be comfortable if I read about it on the front page of the paper. Like, like I grew up with an expectation that I was going to behave in a way that contributed to the community, not destroyed from it. And so, you know, and I'm, I'm certainly not, you know, not an angel for sure, but I am, you know, that, that, that's been always been really important to me. And I also believe when I look at it from a purely, for want of a say, business minded perspective, I believe um, that if you're paying attention to people and planet and profits in equal measure, um, that you end up with a better outcome. Like, I don't think you can say I'm going to zealously make all my decisions just based on the planet impact or just based on the impact on people. Because if you're not sustaining your business from a profitability perspective, you're not going to be able to be around to do that. On the other side, I believe if you're only going you know, driving short-term profits, you're going to get caught up on that too, and you're not going to have sustainability. So I think the concept, you know, when I say sustainability, obviously, you know, that word can be used in, in purely environmental perspective. But for me, sustainability is about if you're, if you're balancing people, planet, and profits in a way that, um, that you know you're taking those things into account I do believe that's a more sustainable business model I believe you'll be here for the longer term I believe you'll be making better contributions and you know linking back to the person I can't remember who I quoted um you know you're a better ancestor and and mm -hmm. that's important to me but I also think it's important to business I don't think I don't think businesses I think today unfortunately you can still get away with not being a social social purpose business but i don't think in a decade you will be and i and i 100 percent don't believe in 20 years you'll be able to so if you're in a business and you're not thinking about how you're balancing across these you know the three p's mm -hmm. um i think your days are numbered and it's only a matter of how many days uh, i absolutely agree and and as you say and then it's that balance it's keeping each of them uh in right. front of mind uh, because exactly if we over-index too much in one area, then we'll, as a business, and sustainability, and I love how you take the, the broader view of sustainability, and that's important for us to find uh, viable paths forward. And Evelyn uh, really appreciated the, the three Ps and, and mentioned that they're in a journey of starting the social purpose and how to embed that into their organization. So any advice around how to start that conversation, how to get momentum around having more of a focus on social purpose, uh, especially if there's a little, maybe a little focus on profits uh, more so in the past? <laughs> well, you know, I think you can start like, you know, it's, it's much like how you give at home, right? Like if I said, you know, how much should you give to charity as an example? Right. Well, that answer, that's an impossible question because that answer is completely different for every family. Right. And it's I think it's the same thing when we say, you know, how do you balance social purpose as a business? I'd say think hard about your business in terms of what's the right way to start for you. And it only takes it, it's such a momentum builder. Like, and, you know, I, as you mentioned, I just recently joined TELUS. One of the reasons that attracted me to TELUS was its focus on social purpose. And like here, um, it's embedded top to bottom, left to right through this company. And I just love that so much. And that's not meant to be an infomercial. That's just the reality of how TELUS operates. And, but when I see things like, you know, we have TELUS Days of Giving where, you know, in the month of May, every employee is encouraged to get out and do something. Every group is encouraged to get out and do something in the community and give volunteer hours. That's something any business can do, right? You can say we're having Giving Friday and we're all going to go and, you know, go help sort food at a food bank, right? And that seems like a small thing, 
But even if you're a small three person business and you do that, if you do that a couple of times, all of a sudden it's shifting that that's a part of our business now, isn't it? That's mm -hmm. not just something we do because it's nice to do. It's part of our business model. Same way about, you know, what's our sustainability, right? It can be as simple as saying, okay, we operate a building. Let's think about how we use some smart building controls to better manage our draw on, on energy. You know, and you might think, oh, okay, well, I'm not, you know, a massive oil and gas company, so I can't change emissions in the world. But yes, you can. If every small business in Canada used smart building controls to control its energy use, we would make a big difference, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's about thinking through what's the right way to start it in your business. And then, you know, and then you learn it in and then it becomes part of your culture. It's the same thing when you're making a decision when I talked earlier about discipline, force yourself to look at, to, you know, and you don't have to do it every time, but it's a muscle you have to build. So start asking yourself when you're making a decision, okay, I want to look at that. Is it profitable? We all tend to ask that if we're for profit companies. Um, is it right for my people? Is it right for the people I serve? Is it right for my community? Is it right for the planet? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'll find an answer and you'll go, wow, that's pretty good for my profits, but it's kind of bad for that. And it's kind of good for that. And you're always balancing that. And you're not always going to get it right. It's not always going to be the home run where it hits all four bags, <laughs> but sometimes you'll find solution, but sometimes you'll go, wow, this one really is only one and it's really bad for the others. So I want to think of a different way to do this. And if you're forcing yourself to have those conversations around your leadership table, um, you know, you'll, you'll get there. And comment, excellent insight. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and my own observations on that, Heather, I really, once again, a common thread that we've touched on is it's those small changes that have big impacts and also appreciate. And I find this happens so often when we think of, again, very aspirational goals, important goals, things that we're excited about getting out there and implementing, we can often get caught up in, okay, it needs to be massive. And then that whole idea that it has to be almost bigger than life, we don't look at, well, and, and I love your question, where can I start? If I'm a, if I'm a, a solopreneur, or I have a team of three, we can go to a local food bank. That is social, that's starting the social purpose conversation. It's starting the social purpose focus, and then we can build and build and over time. And I love how you talk about how it's a habit. We have to make it a part of our operational DNA, our personal and professional DNA, and then it unlocks other opportunities. So, so, so good. Uh, absolutely love that. I've got a, a, another question uh, from Dave, who is wondering, there's also a lot of focus on on remote work, hybrid work. Uh, you name the you name the uh, the the description. So, wh what do you think about that? How what do you think for from organizations from a culture standpoint? Like where where are we on this? Uh, oh my gosh! Do we have another hour? Um, <laughs> that's a really tough one. Like, you know, we're we're evolving through it. I would say, and I think. You know, I, I could sit here and, you know, personally, uh, I'm, I'm remote friendly. I think people find their way. Although, as you can see, I come in the office virtually every day because that works for me. And I think that um, if you take that approach of what works for me and what works for my team, uh, you make the right decisions. But that, but that being said, I also don't cast blame of businesses who are saying, okay, everybody has to come back to the office three days a week, or everybody has to come back five days a week. To the point of, you know, as I said earlier about how to, you know, how do we operate an interest rate, a growing interest rate environment? Like, raise your hand if you've led successfully in a decision of remote versus stay-at-home work. Mm -hmm. Like we're all learning our way through it and we're all trying to find the right way. And human contact and human belonging is important. Mm -hmm. And your work in, in Western society, I can't speak to Eastern, I can speak to Canadian. That's where I've worked my whole career. Um, in Canadian society, a sense of belonging is an intrinsic part of your satisfaction with work. And human contact is important 
to a sense of belonging. So I think as a leader, you have to think about that and you have to think hard about that. And whether that's by saying, okay, we're just going to encourage everybody once a month to get together, or we're going to try and figure out how to create that sense of belonging in a fully online world where everybody's fully distributed, or we're going to have everybody coming back to work every day. I mean, you have to think hard about what are the choices that are right for you and your team. But the only thing I'd say is consistent is we took for granted that sense of belonging because the work environment created it for us for most of our careers. And now you can't take that for granted. As a leader, you have to be spending thought time on how do I make sure my team all feels they belong here? And, you know, you can go down a diversity angle on that. You can go down a work from home angle, like so many things. But um, if you want to have your team engaged feeling good about themselves, feeling good about their business, your business, and feeling good about what, how, you know, continuing this journey with you, they have to feel like they belong in, in every possible way. And I think most of the work from home versus remote, you know, versus office discussions, I don't see them having that layer to the discussion and I find that sad because to me and I, I'm an expert but I feel like that's the most important part of the discussion whatever model I choose how am I making sure my team members feel like they belong well love that focus and and so many others commented on this on belonging and connection uh just spoke with Gary Ridge uh former CEO and and uh, chairman of WD40 and talked about the importance of belonging and how critical that is and that connection. And I'm thrilled that I had a CEO mastermind with Dr. Robert Waldinger, uh, the best-selling author of The Good Life and echoed exactly, Heather, what you're saying about, you boil down all the research around what leads to a healthy life, psychologically, emotionally, physically, it's all about relationships. Relationships mm -hmm. matter more than anything else. And so introducing that into the conversation more, I love that you're highlighting that because that's such an important piece that as human beings, we are here to connect with one another, to have relationships and meaningful relationships. And so how do we do that? How do we foster that sense of belonging and, and connection? We've got about 10 minutes left, so time is flying by. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got another question going back a little bit. Uh, Jack uh, highlighted that, uh, really appreciated the, the conversation around, um, you know, who you should be uh, supposed to be, and then the imposter syndrome. So that's, that really resonates and has been struggling with that. So anything additional to add around how to navigate that, because it can create a sense of uh, instability, if you will, in terms of their day to day. So love to hear your, your, your take on that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'd love to hear your take on it, Craig. I, I'm serious. Like, I think it's, it's a, an, you know, a, such an important concept. And I'm not sure I even really understand it, except to say I, I've experienced it. I know I have. I've seen, I've been around a lot of other people experiencing it. And uh, maybe it's going to show a bit of my emotional immaturity, but it makes me really angry. Like, mm -hmm. I, and when I say it makes me angry, I kind of feel what are we doing wrong that's making people feel less than yeah what yeah. are we you know what's wrong in my environment when i have an impression that i feel less than like yeah, I, yeah i'm not perfect i'm not 100 percent at everything i'm not great at everything why is that letting me feel less than and you know and i think when i think about imposter syndrome and again full disclaimer i'm not an expert like, that's what I think imposter syndrome is, isn't it? Like, it's somebody feeling less than. They're feeling mm -hmm. that, you know, they're not up to what's expected here. And it makes, and it does, it makes me re a little sad and a whole lot angry. And so, uh, you know, when I hear people, when they ask me about it, because I have a lot of people asking, you know, have you faced it, I'm facing it. And, you know, it's probably really bad advice that'll make you, you know, shudder. But I'm like, you know, the hell with that. Like, you're good enough. You're damn fine, actually. You're really great. And you bring things to this table that nobody else brings. So be proud of those and think of those. And yes, be reflective. Yes, think about like, 
where you can be better. Yes, think about where there's a mismatch between the person you want showing up every day and the person you feel is showing up every day and work on that. I'm not like I'm a huge believer in self-development and I'm not saying I'm not, but but don't feel less than. Feel not yet then. Feel like <laughs> I'm not that yet yeah. and I'm working on it and that's great. Yeah. Not I'm not that, oh, this is awful. And therefore, I should hide my light and not give my opinion and not bring my best self to work because I'm not perfect. Of course, you're not. Who's perfect? No one. But anyway, I probably you need to correct me because I probably just messed up the whole. <laughs> not at all. No, and uh, comments as well. Like, thank you. This is great. And 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 I love that sense of uh, of enoughness. Because um, had a discussion with Terrell, Daryl Van Tongeren, uh, who wrote the book Humble, and what he was talking about is humility and his definition, a sense of enoughness that as you were saying, I belong. And I think, and borrowing what you shared before, which I think is incredibly powerful, it's balance. It's so what I have to say, my light matters in this room, others' lights matter in this room. And so it's striking that balance and then recognizing, okay, so what, what are the signals in my environment that may be triggering this? What are the signals within me? So it's what I love is almost like that pre-mortem example is that look at this from multiple sides to gain more insight and i think that's the really key piece and a question that i love that you're you know challenging us to reflect on heather is to say okay so what am i doing to create a safe environment what am i doing to reinforce positive behaviors because a lot of times as human beings we tend to point out problems so when things are going well we don't say anything about it it's almost like well yes. that's expected but then well we got to get together to talk about an issue and it's in in our psychology well, when we get 10 pieces of feedback and one of them is negative, we can really focus on the negative, if not solely on the negative. So recognizing that, and again, the steps to creating a positive environment, a reinforcing environment, how am I recognizing the people that are here and how am I delivering constructive observations, even if I have to give constructive feedback, ensuring that how sacred the person is, valuing that and holding them in a safe way so that, hey, we're here, you're not here yet. This feedback can assist you in that, and I'm here to support you to do it. So, such an important topic because I, I I hear about it uh, a, a lot as well. I have a, a couple of other questions. Which is great. Uh, Aaron was wondering, just starting out on their journey as as a leader. So, any advice, any thoughts around what they can do to be at their best and be the best leader that they can be. Well, I think, you know, leader, first of all, leader is a big word, like you can be a leader of a lot of things, but if the question is specifically about being like a leader of people in a direct, you know, supervisory relationship, I would say, recognize the importance of the start of that journey. Mm -hmm. I have probably only a few true regrets in life. You know, this may be an overshare. One is not having a third child. I lost that battle with my husband. Uh, but the uh, but I would say number two on my list would be when I first started leading people. Like you know, I got promoted very you know fairly young. I was leading a team. I felt a maybe imposter syndrome. I don't know a lot of pressure. I got very focused on okay, we got to deliver the results. We got to do this. We got to you know we got to get this done. And I did not pay nearly enough attention to the importance of that transition to how to lead others. Mm. And I also didn't pay enough attention to understanding that how you lead others is a one-on-one -on -one sport. It's not a zone game. Like you have to understand each person at an individual level. You know, I took it to, okay, here's how I'm going to lead. I got to read the book. I'm going to lead. And damn it, everybody's going to be led that way. <laughs> and they're going to like it. <laughs> and it's going to be great. And we're going to hit our results and everybody's going to be happy here, right? Okay, who's with me? And then you shoulder check and you realize everybody else is way back because you don't have anybody with you. And I, you know, and I, this is the number one piece of advice I give people because I tell you, it took me a long time to figure out that shoulder checking I wasn't doing and that the team wasn't with me. And I spent a long time after unlearning how not to lead. Mm -hmm. And I'm still on that journey. I still like, you know, although I'm here, I'm happy to do this podcast. Like I don't consider myself a great leader and that's not imposter syndrome. I don't consider myself a great leader yet. Mm -hmm. like, I am on that journey 
uh, and I'm still on that journey. And I and I really regret not being intentional enough on that when I was first in that role. Mm -hmm. And so that's my biggest piece of advice. Like, if you're now leading a team for the first time, or or leading a team early in your career, or early into that journey of leading the team, it is your number one priority. I don't care what anybody else tells you. It is your number one factor to success. How you cement those habits that you will now then carry through the rest of your career mm. and you can either not cement them well and spend the rest of your life trying to unlearn them <laughs> or you can invest now and put you know put in the reps and learn it and so then you can build off it for the rest of your career that's the choice you have well, love it and uh and and a couple them have to find a way to put yet into the title of this podcast like that's gotta be <laughs> I'm, ch I'm challenging the podcast team right here at uh, wherever we are in the recording. Have to find that. And and the other piece, so much, the two things, again, I want to build on and, and acknowledge is that the focus on leading others, because I find you're so right that when people get in leadership positions, it's a, well, it's about them. It's about, okay, what do I need to do? And I, I, and, and getting, and, and it's an understandable reflex. And then I love how you say, this is a one-on-one -on -one piece. I need to understand each of the players on my team. Who are they? What are they about? What do they value? And also appreciate, again, a, 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 a word you've used throughout. And again, I, I trust that people really uh, take this away with them as well, intention and intentionality. When we have intention, when we commit to doing things, then that just maximizes the chances we're gonna have a positive impact and we're more thoughtful. Of, about what we're doing and why we're doing it. So this has just been awesome. Uh, we're really near the tail end here. And so uh, before before we say goodbye uh, this afternoon, Heather, is there anything else you wanna share? Any topics that we didn't touch on today? We, we really ran a broad, <laughs> a diverse array of topics and great engagement. And so many people are putting in their comments about how much they've enjoyed hearing from you and learning more about you and your insights. Any final thoughts or observations you'd like to share with the audience today? Um, no, I mean, I think, you know, you summed it up, like live with intention. And, and maybe I could say, you know, you're not there yet, but you're enough already. Mm. And I think that, you know, recognizing that, I think that's probably, you know, and, and again, like, that's something I really wish I had believed in myself a lot earlier than I did. Well, thank you for those inspiring parting words. And as a final point, uh, before we close today, just wanted to remind people that uh, have two amazing guests this week. Uh, on Friday afternoon at three o'clock, I'm gonna be welcoming Dr. Robin Stern. She's the author of The Gaslight Effect. So that's something that has come up a lot in my conversations, how to spot and survive the hidden manipulative others used to control your life. And uh, Dr. Stern is the co-founder of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. So this will surely be another fascinating conversation. Heather, thank you so, so much. I've been looking thank forward you. to this. I know how busy uh, your, how many commitments you have, let's put it as opposed to busy. What I'm choosing to do, all the things right. I'm choosing to do. You've chosen to be here with me and with us this afternoon, and I learned so much as I always do. And I know from the comments I've received, you've really not just uh, inspired, provided some really tangible, powerful takeaways for everyone. So thank you. It was an absolute pleasure having you here. And to everyone else, take care. Look forward thank to seeing you. you on a future episode. Bye for now.